When somebody mentions Civil War locations, most people think of places like Gettysburg or any one of the dozens of national and state park battlefields in Virginia and Georgia. Few people think of downtown Los Angeles when they think of the American Civil War. California was far away from the East Coast battlefields, but it didn't escape the war. The deadliest conflict in American history spanned from both coasts and dramatic events happened right here in Southern California. Downtown LA sits on what was for centuries the Tongva village Sonanga, until the Spanish arrived from Mexico and started the mission system, which was the end of Tongva independence. The town of Our Lady the Queen of the Angels was founded by new Spanish settlers in 1781 and was a small town for a long time. The oldest house in the city, an adobe built in 1818, was built when the town was almost four decades old. Most of the land annexed into the city of Los Angeles today was ranch land, privatized from the San Gabriel Mission to the east and the San Fernando Mission to the northwest. Many of the Civil War's big names on the East Coast, like Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee, first saw combat in the Mexican War. But the East Coast only has veterans, while the Southwest has Mexican War battlefields. The first presence of U.S. troops in Los Angeles was in 1846, and the small expeditionary force had to leave in order to not be captured by the Mexican California militia. After Alta California made a separate peace with the U.S. in 1847, Many of the soldiers in the Mormon Battalion stayed in Southern California and built up infrastructure and businesses in Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and San Diego. The Army's Mormon Volunteers set up Fort Moore on this hill, which was in service for over a decade. Southern California was a place where politics made strange bedfellows in the late 1850s. There were fewer than 2,000 Mexican Californians eligible for military service in 1846, but after gold was discovered in 1848, over 100,000 Anglo-Americans and European immigrants showed up in California and annihilated the ethnic Mexicans' political power as a voting bloc. Most Anglo-American settlers were bigoted toward Mexican Californians in the northern part of the state, but Southern California was a different story. Many of the Anglo settlers here were Southerners, and they found allies in the Californios. Southern planters had a similar social rank structure as the Mexican Californian aristocrats. The Southerners were raised on plantations, while the Californios were raised on ranchos. Horses and horsemanship were symbols of wealth and power in both cultures. Southerners had a permanent laboring class in African Americans, while Californios had a permanent laboring class in Native Americans. Southern Anglo-Democrats call themselves the chivalry, while in the Spanish language, the word caballero is the same word for horseman and gentleman and knight. As the sectional crisis deepened in the late 1850s, California's Mexican aristocracy allied itself with Southern Democrats to protect their political power. They almost succeeded in breaking off Southern California as a new state that would be a slave state, but the turmoil from the 1860 election and the secession crisis interrupted that plan. By 1860, the city of Los Angeles had over 4,000 residents, with around 10,000 people total in the whole county. This spot on Spring and 2nd Street was the location of the first brick schoolhouse in the city, which I don't care about. But what I do care about is that the U.S. Army Quartermaster Station was on this block where the old L.A. Times building stands today. We'll get back to the Quartermaster Corps in a minute. More importantly, the Butterfield Overland Mail Company had their office here. The Butterfield Overland Company was a literal pioneer in opening up the Wild West for English speakers. They built the roads carrying passengers and freight from El Paso, Texas to San Francisco, California. Yes, there were other stagecoach lines like Pioneer, there were charter stagecoaches, Wells Fargo had their own stagecoaches, but the Butterfield Company was king. They built the roads, and a lot of small towns popped up along those roads that were totally dependent on interstate travel. Their operations in the Southwest and on the West Coast were subsidized by a contract with the federal government. When the war was getting started in 1861, the government canceled the contract and, overnight, operations ground to a halt from Texas to California. It was bad enough for people in California to lose their one way to send mail overland, but for frontier settlements like Tucson, Arizona, losing the stagecoach meant they were cut off from the rest of the world, and it's one of the reasons why Arizona became the eighth entity to secede in 1861. Long before these skyscrapers were here in Los Angeles, this intersection was a place where stagecoaches were arriving and taking off all day and night, ready to take people, 
mail, and goods across the Southwest, and this went on right up until March 1861. By this time, Southern-born officers were resigning their army commissions by the hundreds, and they were followed by thousands of enlisted soldiers who deserted so they could join the Confederate Army. At the same time, federal forts across the western half of the continent were abandoned between March and April. In a short time, the stagecoaches were gone. Fort Tejon, north of Los Angeles, was abandoned, leaving travelers open to highway robbery. Fort Mojave and its satellite camps at the edge of California were abandoned, leaving native warriors free to raid. Then Arizona seceded and joined the rebellion. The Colorado River was the one barrier between the Confederate States of America and San Bernardino County. Eventually, Camp Latham and the Drum Barracks were set up outside the south side of Los Angeles, but as of late March and early April of 1861, the one soldier in the U.S. Army in Los Angeles was Major Winfield Scott Hancock. Hancock was the quartermaster for the Pacific Department's Southern District of California. The quartermaster depot was on today's 2nd and Spring Street, but Hancock stayed at a little adobe house with a corral at the south edge of town. The approximate location of the Hancock adobe and corral is Main Street between 2nd and 3rd, closer to 3rd than 2nd, but none of it remains today. When we look at the 1860 election map, we see that Southern Democrats dominated Los Angeles County. In April 1861, people in Los Angeles County generally supported the rebellion. Until federal reinforcements landed at the port of San Pedro later in April and set up Camp Latham and Drum Barracks south of the city, Winfield Scott Hancock stood alone as the Union presence in a city full of copperheads. We jump three blocks north to the corner of Main Street and Temple. Fletcher Bowron Square is named after the 35th mayor of Los Angeles. It sits on the location of the once famous Bella Union Hotel. This hotel was THE social center for Southern sympathizers. The Knights of the Golden Circle had meetings here. When future Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston resigned his U.S. Army commission, he stayed at this hotel. When future Confederate General Louis Armistead resigned his Army commission, he stayed here. The Sheriff of Los Angeles, Tomas Sanchez, a chivalry Democrat, came to work and socialize at the Bella Union Hotel. Pro-Confederate undersheriffs Andrew Jackson King and Alonzo Ridley came to work and to socialize here. After news of the Battle of Fort Sumter reached the West Coast, the hotel owners hung a portrait of Confederate General Pierre Beauregard in the lobby. Under Sheriff King went parading down Main Street with that portrait of General Beauregard, for which federal troops entered Los Angeles specifically to arrest him for sedition. King was compelled to take the loyalty oath to the Union and then paroled by the Army, making him possibly the first reconstructed rebel in the country in April of 1861. During the war, federal soldiers stationed at Los Angeles were forbidden from going into the Bella Union for their own safety. Now so far I've mentioned the sheriff and two undersheriffs. In March of 61, another key Civil War event happened here, and these guys were involved. In a meeting that took place in the Los Angeles County Court, which was inside the Bella Union building, 82 men enlisted in a new militia company they called the Los Angeles Mounted Rifles. Under Sheriff Alonzo Ridley was elected captain and company commander. Sheriff Sanchez was made a first lieutenant. Almost half of the volunteers were Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies, but all the volunteers were Southern sympathizers. That's right, LASD sympathized with the Confederacy during the Civil War. This new militia company in Los Angeles was accepted into the California State Militia and they received rifles from the state armory with the expectation that this militia company would serve the Union. Instead, the LA Mounted Rifles actually planned to go fight for the South. In the summer of 1861, almost half of the company snuck out of California with their state-issued weapons. Sheriff Sanchez didn't go, but under Sheriff Ridley did. When the California men reached West Texas, they joined the Confederate Army but their biggest contribution to the Confederate war effort was escorting future Confederate generals Albert Sidney Johnston and Louis Armistead during their escape to Texas. And the party took the Butterfield Overland Mail route, since the stagecoach roads were practically empty but still usable. They started at a ranch near Los Angeles, then they stopped in the pro-Confederate stronghold of El Monte, then they stopped and camped at Rancho Chino, 
Then they made their way down into East San Diego County and into Northern Mexico to dodge Fort Yuma, until they reached Confederate Arizona and then Texas. Most of the renegade California militiamen who made it to Texas ended up serving in the Arizona Brigade. After the 32 members of the company escaped to Dixie with their state-issued rifles, the remainder of the company in Los Angeles was disbanded by the state military department. Sheriff Sanchez suffered no consequences because he claimed plausible deniability of the plot to leave. And I have no doubt that this very plot was discussed in back rooms over booze and cigars in this very hotel in this location. Right next door to the Bella Union Hotel, on the same block, was the headquarters of the Los Angeles Star. The Star was the first English language newspaper in Los Angeles, and had ran for a decade when the Civil War started. During the war, the Star's editor and contributors were rabidly pro-Confederate and anti-Lincoln. The founder and editor, Henry Hamilton, published such gems as, quote, Woe to you who do not support Uncle Abe! for he is invested with more power than ever Caesar possessed over the Romans." End quote. Another gem published in the Star said, "...hundreds of millions of dollars have to be raised to support waste and extravagance of maintaining half a million men as food for powder." The Star called this war an abolition war, quote, "...instigated, carried on, and consummated to the degradation of the white race and the elevation of the African family over them." End quote. Thus, it's no surprise that the paper's founder, Henry Hamilton, was arrested by the Union Army for sedition in 1862 and sent to Fort Alcatraz. During that time, the Federal Postal Service banned his seditious newspaper from being mailed, and then the Army shut the paper down. But, Hamilton was paroled, and after a brief hiatus, he was allowed to publish again. Then, the Southern Democrats of Los Angeles elected him to the State Senate in 1863. And of course, every time federal troops patrolled through the city of Los Angeles or its nearby suburbs like El Monte, the star was complaining about it. So earlier I mentioned Winfield Scott Hancock. Then I mentioned how Louis Armistead and General Johnston escaped from Los Angeles with the rebel militia so they could serve as officers in the Confederate Army. Major Hancock stayed in Los Angeles through the summer of 1861 before he went back east. He thought he would resume quartermaster duties for the growing Federal Army, but instead, he was made a Brigadier General of Infantry. Armistead and Hancock might be the most famous frenemies in American history. These old Army buddies became best friends when they were still in the same Army and stationed in the same area, and they met one last time before Armistead escaped back east, and they ended up on opposite sides of the Civil War. Hancock served the Union in the Army of the Potomac, while Armistead was in the Army of Northern Virginia. Both men were at the Battle of Gettysburg, and both men were wounded there by gunfire. General Hancock survived his wounds from Gettysburg, while General Armistead died in Pickett's charge. Albert Sidney Johnston became a general officer in the senior ranks of the Confederate armies. Once he made it to Richmond from Texas, he was given command of the Confederacy's Western Military Department. The ex-undersheriff of Los Angeles, Alonzo Ridley, having earned Johnson's trust on the march across the desert, was commissioned as one of Johnston's staff officers. After General Johnston was killed in the Battle of Shiloh, Ridley transferred into the 3rd Texas Cavalry Regiment of the Arizona Brigade. He was captured in the Battle of Fort Butler in 1863 and endured two years as a POW. The Los Angeles Star published again from 1863 to 1864, but one week before the 1864 election, when the victory at Atlanta made it clear that Abraham Lincoln would win, the paper went on another hiatus, since there was really no point in influencing public opinion. However, it came back again for the 1868 election, and then had another run until 1873. Los Angeles and its suburb of El Monte were patrolled on a regular basis by federal troops from the California Volunteers for the rest of the war. Tomas Sanchez served as Sheriff of Los Angeles until 1867. He remained active in local politics and retired to his family's property, Rancho La Cienega. And, 19th century Los Angeles being 19th century Los Angeles, it should be no surprise that in 1880, the city elected a Confederate veteran as its mayor. I hope you enjoyed this tour of some Civil War locations in downtown Los Angeles. Remember, this was a national conflict making waves from coast to coast. The war between the states and territories wasn't just happening in Northern Virginia. It was happening across the Wild West as well, with cowboys and gold miners and lawmen taking up arms for the North, 
or the South, and it happened right here. I'd like to give a shout out to the Southern California Civil War Roundtables. My friends, LA and SoCal Civil War history is our heritage. Wherever you are, good morning or good evening, and please remember to hit like and subscribe because it helps out the channel. And I promise, soon, very, very soon, I will release the book, The Confederate Territory of Arizona, which contains even more information than I had time to put in the documentary. I'll keep you folks posted on its release, and thank you for your support.